Just then the livery stable man brought in his bill for six weeks keeping. Stall room for the horse, $15. Hay for the horse, 250 The genuine Mexican plug had eaten a ton of the article, and the man said he would have eaten a hundred if he had let him. I will remark here in all seriousness that the regular price of hay during that year and a part of the next was really $250 a ton. During a part of the previous year, it had sold at 500 a ton in gold, and during the winter before that, there was such scarcity of the ar article that in several instances, small quantities had bought, brought $800 a ton in coin. The consequence might be guessed without my telling it. People turned their stock loose to starve, and before the spring arrived, Carson and Eagle Valleys were almost literally carpeted with their carcasses. Any old settler there will verify these statements. I managed to pay the livery bill, and that same day I gave the genuine Mexican plug to a passing Arkansas immigrant whom fortune delivered into my hand. If this ever meets his eye, he will doubtlessly remember the donation. Now, whoever has had the luck to ride a real Mexican plug will recognize the animal depicted in this chapter and hardly consider him exaggerated. But the, but the uninitiated will feel justified in regarding his portrait as a fancy sketch, perhaps. Chapter 25, The Mormons in Nevada. How to persuade a loan from them. Early history of the territory. Silver mines discovered. The new territorial government. A foreign one and a poor one. It's funny struggles for existence. No credit, no cash. Old Abe Curry sustains it and its officers. Instructions and vouchers. An Indian's endorsement. Toll gates. Originally, Nevada was a part of Utah and was called Carson County. And a pretty large county it was, too. Certain of its valleys produced no end of hay, and this attracted small colonies of Mormon stock raisers and farmers to them. A few Orthodox Americans straggled in from California, but no love was lost between two, the two classes of colonists. There was little or no friendly intercourse, each party said, to stay to itself. The Mormons were largely in the majority and had the additional advantage of being peculiarly under the protection of the Mormon government of the territory. Therefore, they could afford to be distant and even preemptory toward their neighbors. One of the traditions of Carson Valley illustrates the condition of things that prevailed at the time I speak of. The hired girl of one of the American families was Irish and a Catholic, yet it was noted with surprise that she was the only person outside of the Mormon ring who could get favors from the Mormons. She asked kindness, kindnesses of them often and always got them. It was a mystery to everybody. But one day as she was passing out at the door, a large bowie knife dropped from under her apron. And when her mistress asked her an explanation, she observed that she was going out to bore a wash tub from the Mormons. <laughs> In 1858, silver loads were discovered in Carson County. And then the aspect of things changed. Californians began to flock in, and the American element was soon in the majority. Allegiance to Brigham Young in Utah was renounced, and a temporary territorial government for Washu was instituted by, one, by the citizens. Governor Roop was the first and only chief magistrate of it. In due course of time, Congress passed a bill to organize Nevada Territory and President Lincoln sent out Governor Nye to supplant Roop. At this time, the population of the territory was about 12 or 15,000 and rapidly increasing. Silver mines were being vigorously developed and silver mills erected. Business of all kinds was active and prosperous and growing more so day by day. The people were glad to have a legitimately constituted government but did not particularly enjoy having strangers from distant states 
put an authority over them, a sentiment that was natural enough. They thought the officials should have been chosen from among themselves, from among prominent citizens who had earned a right to such promotion, and who would be in sympathy with the populace and likewise thoroughly acquainted with the needs of the territory. They were right in viewing the matter thus, without doubt. The new officers were immigrants, and that was no title to anybody's affection or admiration either. The new government was received with considerable coolness. It was not only a foreign intruder, but a poor one. It was not even worth plucking, except by the smallest of small fry, office seekers and such. Everybody knew that Congress had appropriated only $20,000 a year in greenbacks for its support, about money enough to run a quartz mill a month. And everybody knew also that the first year's money was still in Washington and that the getting hold of it would be a tedious and difficult process. Carson City was too wary and too wise to open up a credit account with the imported bantling with anything like indecent haste. There is something solemnly funny about the struggles of a newborn territorial government to get a start in this world. Ours had a trying time of it. The Organic Act and the instructions from the State Department commanded that a legislature should be elected at such and such time and its sittings inaugurated at such and such date. It was easy to get legislatures even at three dollars a day, although board was four dollars and fifty cents, for distinction has its charm in Nevada as well as elsewhere. And there were plenty of patriotic souls out of employment, but to get a legislative, legislative hall for them to meet in was another matter altogether. Carson blandly declined to give a room rent free or let one of the government or let one up to the government on credit. But when Curry heard of the difficulty, he came forward solitary and alone and shouldered the ship of state over the bar and got her afloat again. I referred to Curry, old Curry, old Abe Curry. But for him, the legislature would have been obliged to sit in the desert. He offered his large stone building just outside the capital limits rent-free, and it was gladly accepted. Then he built a horse railroad from town to the capital and carried the legislators gratis. He also furnished pine benches and chairs for the legislature and covered the floors with clean sawdust by way of carpet and spittoon combined. But for Curry, the government would have been died in its tender infancy. A canvas partition to separate the Senate from the House of Representatives was put up by the Secretary at a cost of $3.40, but the United States declined to pay for it. Upon being reminded that the instructions permitted the payment of a liberal rent for a legislative hall, and that the money was saved to the country by Mr. Curry's generosity, the United States said that, d it, that said that that did not alter the matter and the three dollars and forty cents would be subtracted from the secretary's eighteen hundred dollars salary and it was the matter of printing was from the beginning an interesting feature of the new government's difficulties the secretary was sworn to obey his volume of written instructions and these commanded him to do two certain things without fail viz. 1. Get the House and Senate journals printed, and 2. For this work, pay $1.50 per thousand for composition and $1.50 per token for press work and greenbacks. It was easy to swear to do these two things, but it was entirely impossible to do more than one of them. When greenbacks had gone down to 40 cents on the dollar, the prices regularly charged everybody by printing establishments were one dollar and fifty cents per thousand and one dollar and fifty cents per token in gold. The instructions commanded that the secretary regard a paper dollar issued by the government as equal to any other dollar issued by the government. Hence the printing of the journals was discontinued. Then the United States sternly rebuked the secretary for disregarding the instructions and warned him to correct his ways. Wherefore he got some printing done forwarded the bill to Washington with full exhibits of the high prices of things in the territory and called attention to a printed market report 
wherein it would be observed that even hay was $250 a ton. The United States responded by subtracting the printing bill from the Secretary's suffering salary, and moreover remarked with dense gravity that he would find nothing in his instructions requiring him to purchase hay. Nothing in this world is pulled in such impenetrable obscurity as a U.S. Treasury Comptroller's understanding. The fairy fires of the hereafter could get up nothing more than a fitful glimmer in it. In the days I speak of, he never could be made to comprehend why it was that $20,000 would not go as far in Nevada, where all commodities ranged at an enormous figure as it would in the other territories, where exceeding cheapness was the rule. He was an officer who looked out for the little expenses all the time. The secretary of the territory kept his office in his bedroom, as I before remarked, and he charged the United States to no rent, although his instructions provided for that item, and he could have justly taken advantage of it, a thing which I would have done with more than lightning promptness if I had been secretary myself. But the United States never applauded this devotion. Indeed, I think my country was ashamed to have so improvident a person in its employ. Those instructions, we used to read a chapter from them every morning as intellectual gymnastics, and a couple of chapters in Sunday school every Sabbath, for they treated of all subjects under the sun and had much valuable religious matter in them along with the other statistics. Those instructions commanded that the, that the commanded that pen knives, envelopes, pens, and writing paper be furnished the members of the legislature. So the secretary made the purchase and the distribution. The knives cost three dollars a piece. There was one too many, and the secretary gave it to the clerk of the House of Representatives. The United States said the clerk of the House was not a member of the legislature and took that three dollars out of the secretary's salary, as usual. White men charged three or four dollars a load for sawing up stove wood. The secretary was sagacious enough to know that the United States would never pay any such price as that, so he got an Indian to saw up a load of office wood at one dollar and a half. He made out the usual voucher but signed no name to it, simply appended a note explaining that an Indian had done the work and had done it in a very capable and satisfactory way, but could not sign the voucher owing to lack of ability in the necessary direction. The secretary